Sorry for cutting that last one off a bit short. I kind of didn't really have a choice. I had to do my job, and I didn't feel like uh, chopping it up and doing the editing. I figured just cut it off. So, let's just uh, continue, shall we? So, in RPGs, do you think that you should format the text in such a way that you can read it, rather than have it in the formatting that you're going to need to do when you put space into the YouTube? Well, yes, I do think that formatting should be done. There we go. Okay. In RPGs, what do you think of giving players no clear-cut good versus evil choices, or having players commit the necessary evil choices, like in the arrival for Mass Effect 2? Can you think of any other situations where such choices are present and done properly? Actually, the arrival is probably one of my favorite examples of that. I have always been a defender of the arrival. I think it was done well. I think it was enjoyable. And I think the fact that you, as to say, Shepard, had no real choice was f fairly well done and was something that it was at least interesting or engaged or whatever. Engaging. And made sense. And this is the most important part. It made sense that you didn't have a choice. And I was with that. So... As far as, you know, in, in general, that concept is not something I like to see overused. It is something I have seen used to some extent uh, properly every now and again. I'm actually really struggling to come up with another option off the top of my head where I've seen that kind of a choice being presented properly. You'll have to forgive me because I'm not coming up with any, actually. Um, I'm really not. Wow, I'm sorry. I I, oh, I was going to give you a uh, mention to, but I like it when it's done properly, and and it, it's such a rare occurrence that I can't even think of an, an example of it. More often than not, it's done as kind of a cheap way of either adding artificial pathos, or just trying to enforce the whole you know this is dark and gritty thing, which I never like. So <laughs> I apologize for not having examples off the top of my head. So let's just go ahead and move on to the next question here. Do you think that having mentally unstable characters such as schizophrenic, suicidal, psychotic, etc. should be in video games, or do you think that's going too far? Let's get one thing very, very clear. I know several people here, in real life, who have genuine mental disorders. It is not a pleasant thing. It is not a fun thing. There is nothing you can do about it other than be patient, be understanding, and control yourself, because they aren't... they can't. And it is a it is a challenge, it is a chore, to be completely honest with you, to handle people like that. And it's one I usually put up with, uh, I, I don't know how to put this, I guess because I, I care, <laughs> you know, and um, I care about these people, and I know that it's not their fault, I know that there's no intent within them to cause me the harm. You know, there was one night where uh, a girl was staying with me, that's not what you think, and she was having psychotic delusions all night, severe bipolarism. And she was biting me so hard. I, I have some of the scars still. You probably can't see them. She was biting me so scar hard she was b breaking skin and clawing at me. And this just went on for hours and hours until her mind finally settled down and she could go to sleep. And when she woke up, she had absolutely no memory of it. And I had I had the scars to prove it. You know, I had the bite marks and the, and the blood to prove it. I, there, were, there was blood all over the carpet and everything. And so it is... A, what I'm trying to get across here is the fact that that kind of thing is tragic and horrible and basically wrong. And I don't think it should be utilized as a tool in order to add to a game unless it is done absolutely perfectly, which I'm not sure is possible to do. So the summary here is no, I don't think real disorders, real mental disorders should be put into video games or movies or books or, or whatnot because real disorders are, are a bad thing and no matter what they do, I don't think they would give them the, the, the gravitas they need, and I don't think, I think it would be dishonorable, I think it would be uh, disrespectful, that's actually the word I'm looking for here, it would be disrespectful to people who do suffer from those things. And finally, just as a, as a summary here, I don't think it adds really. The sort of fake mental disorder people we get in video games works just fine. You know, the Joker is not someone who actually has a mental disorder. He's the Joker. He has Jokerism, you know, for all intents and purposes. What, if he was being examined in real life, he, it wouldn't work like that, if you understand what I'm saying. So I'm fine with the fake uh, mental disorders that villains tend to have of being psychotic and, blah, and all that fun stuff. So, you know, that is just my personal opinion on that one. Now, where the heck did I put the list of questions? Here we go. Okay. What do you feel about Kirk dying? Spoiler alert. In uh, Star Trek Generations. I think it was the right decision. I think it was the right time to do it. I think it was the right movie to do it. I think it was one of the most poorly handled moments in movie history. 
Kirk should die on the bridge does not mean he should fall on a bridge and die. And any of you who know what I'm talking about, you feel free to join me in on this and the sheer exasperation of this one. It was not well done, not well handled, not well settled at all. In the book, it's it's somewhat more it's somewhat better. You know, it is more well done and uh, more appropriate. But killing off a cultural icon like that is something that can be done. But you always have to be really careful when you do it. And it it should have been Star Trek Generations, the movie about Kirk's death, rather than Star Trek Generations. Oh yeah, that's the movie where Kirk dies. If you follow me here, so I think it was terrible. And I think I just wish it was done much better. How do you feel about senseless, unnecessary rage when it comes to immature fans not getting their way 100% of the time? It drives me up the wall, honestly. This is funny, because this is becoming more and more a problem for me recently. Partially as a result of these videos, not that I'm blaming or anything, and partially because I've been really watching development of games uh, lately, especially Blizzard games. I've been getting a lot more exposure to forums and posts and Twitter feeds and all that sort of thing than I usually do, and it's been driving me completely crazy. People will complain in the worst way about the stupidest things. It's just whining for the sake of whining, near as I can tell. It's f I feel like I'm listening to someone who happens to be... Okay, one of, my, uh, one of the people I live with has a two-year-old child, right? Every time he doesn't get his way about something incredibly minuscule and insignificant, like he got a, a Twizzler. This actually happened. Actually, it wasn't a Twizzler. It was a Red Vine. This actually happened yesterday. He got a Red Vine. I gave him a Red Vine. He asked nicely. He got it. And then he wanted more. Now, he couldn't have more because he it, it was a Red Vine, and he was he's two, and he hadn't eaten yet. So he did not get another Red Vine. Would you like to imagine the sheer level of fit that this two-year-old child threw because he didn't get a Red Vine? It was almost funny, if it wasn't for the fact that it was so, wow, you know, you're going to live, kid, it's okay. Now, he's two, so he has a bit of an excuse there. Someone who is capable of typing and understanding and reading and being on the internet and posting these things has lost the excuse and has no right to be acting like that two-year-old child. And that is how I feel about that. I really wish those people would go to another planet and leave us alone. Next question. And I didn't come up with that either. Actually, a friend of mine did, but we were talking, you know, if we had the ability to get rid of those people, oh, we would. Just, you go off and be on your wi the whiny planet. We'll, we'll be over here. How do I feel about the current state of affairs in Final Fantasy, and does there need to be a final Final Fantasy? I feel it's on a downward spiral, spiral and it's a shame I feel that way. Uh, <laughs> I have also said that it could be interpreted that because I said FF13 is one of the worst FFs, that it is that the the FF series is going downhill. I will go on a limb and say that FF12 is one of the better ones in my opinion. So, uh, granted that was done by a different team, but whether or not the FF series is on a downward spiral kind of depends on a game by game basis because it, it, the series has always just kind of done this thing uh, in in little bits and pieces. You know, FF1 was here, and then FF2 was here, and then FF3 was here, and then FF4 was here, and then 5 and 6! Six. 6 is so far up, I can't even reach that high! Anyways, my point I'm getting across here is that I still have hope for the series, but as with as with many things nowadays, it, it kind of depends on a game-by-game -game basis. So we'll see what happens with, for example, FF13 versus... And I don't even know if they've announced... I don't believe they've announced FF15 yet or anything like that. If they do an FF13-3, which I, do, I have heard about that... I am less inclined to get that than I was 13.2, which I was already somewhat disinclined towards. So we'll see. I I, I remain hesitantly hopeful, but not by much, and I, I'll, I will admit that. Next question. This is an amusing one. You know about the underground people you found in Terrace and KOTOR 1, the outcasts? Did they die too, or were they okay? That's a horrible question, and the reason why is because that question has been answered in The Old Republic. Over the series of an entire quest chain, when you go through Terrace on the Republic side, you find out exactly what happened to those people. And uh, I'm not going to recite all of it here, it would take a while, but let's just say things went really, really, really badly for them. And they slowly rotted away, lost all their knowledge, lost all their history, lost all their everything, lost their in intellect, st got to the point where inbreeding was becoming a difficulty, and finally died out, like a century later. 
a century of suffering and misery for those poor outcasts. I felt pretty bad for those guys. Next question. Um, what is your favorite Mega Man series, other than classic, assuming that takes the cake? And why? Conversely, what's your least favorite? And why? That's actually kind of a tough one. I would probably go ahead and say Mega Man X is my favorite, just because it has my favorite Mega Man game, a game I consider art, Mega Man X 1. That being said, the Mega Man Zero series was excellent, and the Mega Man XZ series, or ZX series, I've heard it both ways, was excellent. So, hard call on that one. I would probably go ahead and give the, the point to X, though, for having X, X2, X3, and X4, all of which are unquestionably, in my, my mind, good, great games. X5 was a good game, X6 was another great game with, with some serious issues, and X5 also had the potential to be a, an amazing game if they hadn't screwed with the storyline the way they did. So, so I, I'm going to go ahead and give it to the X-Series. My least favorite series is much easier, Star Force, which I played very, very briefly and then immediately put down. The Battle Network series at least took an interesting concept, and, uh, you know, it, it, it was a reimagining of Mega Man, and I was with that, I was with that. But Star Force, or whatever, Dragon Force, I actually don't remember the name of it now anymore. No. I, I didn't like that at all. Uh, it really, really didn't gel with me. So, next question. Do you think we'll ever get a new Star Wars movie from George Lucas? No. Uh, if so, do you think it will have any potential? Not really. If not, do you think we'll ever see a new Star Wars movie? And if so, who would you want as a director? Now that's an interesting one. Lucas is one of those people who tends to change his mind a lot, as anybody who's followed the Star Wars series and, you know, that sort of thing knows. And he has gone back and changed his mind about some things more than once more than thrice in several cases. So even though he is at the moment saying that he wouldn't do an episode uh, 7, 8, and 9, that is something that is still in the card, something that is still possible. That being said, would Lucas himself do it? Probably not. But the possibility of someone else taking up that mantle and doing it is something I think exists. We're at least another cycle away from that. We, we, we're on a downswing of Star Wars at the moment, and and my god, I, I really hope 1313 rescues us from that, because Star Wars has just been in a plummet lately. But, because <laughs> KOTOR rescued Star Wars once before, if you all remember. Um, so a new movie done with a new director. Now, who is the director? That's a very difficult choice, because my, obvi my immediate answer I can't tell you, because it sounds horrible. I'll just go and say it. Myself. I would ra rather see myself direct that movie. I would really throw my heart and, and soul and being and everything into that. If you've ever seen the the um, the behind-the-scenes stuff in what Peter Jackson was doing for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, that would be me. That is my mindset when I'm working on something like that. You should have seen me back when I was working in, tele in television back in uh, the, the city I'm not going to name. It was only a local TV station. And, and I guess I've mentioned this before anyways, but I threw myself into that. And I was, you know, director, stage manager, whatever you want to call that, guy in the guy in the booth and writer, and I would love, let me emphasize this word one more moment here, I would love the ability to, and the time and the resources to go back and make Star Wars Episode Seven. even if they only gave me one of the movies to work with, that would be amazing experience. It would be tasking, it would be mentally and physically exhausting, and it would be worth every moment of it, and I'd love it. So I'll just be honest. Like I just was, I suppose. Next question. Um, elaborate on why you would not live in to want to live in Warhammer 40k. Warhammer 40k is an interesting setting and an amusing setting, and one I, I do enjoy, actually, more than I probably should. But within reason, there are parts of it I enjoy, and then there are parts of it I really don't. You know, when the whole thing about children f killing each other in order to sc cannibalize the dead because that's how starving and bad things have gotten. In my opinion, that's going a little bit too far. The concept of, an, of a setting where war is the universal concept, for, dif for, for completely different lore-specific lore reasons, I'm with that. The concept of exactly how screwed up the Dark Elves are, not cool with that. The concept of how screwed up the Chaos Marines are, yeah, I'm okay with that. So it's it's very much a hit or miss with Warhammer, and, and whether or not I like any given Warhammer game or Warhammer uh, book tends to depend on what it like what it focuses on. 
for example, the Don Noir series, I'm generally always with, with, with like one exception. You know, I, I have enjoyed that series since the beginning, so to speak. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of derailing from the point, but the point I'm trying to get across here is that Warhammer 40k, at best, is a setting where your entire existence is a non never-ending cycle of war in which you are guaranteed to die, probably a horrible death. On the bad side, we're not going to talk about it, because it's much, much worse. And if I was sent there as a Tier 1, I would take a gun to my head the moment I showed up. If I was sent there as a Tier 2, I'd take a gun to my head and sh shoot myself the moment I show up. As a Tier 3, even when I have a degree of choice in the matter, the best I could hope for was to would be to pop down as an orc. I'd totally be an orc. And, uh, and have fun with it, and then die a bloody horrible death. And even as a Tier 4, even with true total choice in the matter, I would still seriously consider not going to... You know, if they were like, Alright, you can only choose Tier 4 in Warhammer 40k. <laughs> you really have to think about that one, because the whole setting, while amusing to play in, is not the kind of place I would want to live in. Especially not because, if you'll recall, the, the, even the humans in Warhammer 40k live for centuries. Just about every race does. And centuries of, of hellish torment and daily fighting is a little bit too much for me, personally. I'll just be completely honest. So let's go and move on. Now, uh, these are several questions that have been asked since I started posting these reviews tonight. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and go into these here, shall we? Ah, uh, okay. What did you think of Morinth in Mass Effect 2, and what do you think of what Bioware did with her in Mass Effect 3? Morinth was a character that made a lot of sense to me. It was perfectly logical for me to have someone... It, it, was, it was that believability thing. They introduced another element to the believability, but because it was, it was based on the, the precepts that had already been laid out, you know, how the Asari work, how their mental connection thing works, the automatic biotic cap capabilities, all that sort of thing, all of that, and then add some kind of creature that has the ability to, as for what all intents and purposes be is, a vampiric Asari, as a vampiric biotic, was interesting, especially because simply by having that biotic power and having that connection to someone's life energy, they could be as, I hate to use this word, seductive as, they, as she was. And it, is, it would be no difficulty for her to take her conquests and to have her pick of the litter and, and just do whatever she wanted, and she could just enjoy life as much as she wanted. So my point is she made perfect sense. Now, I killed the hell out of her. <laughs> Every time. Even when I was playing Renegade Shepherd. No, 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 no. That, is, that would be the Paragon choice always, because she needed to die. Now, I am aware of the fact that in Mass Effect 3, m she is one of the people, such as Legion and such as uh, Jack, where if you didn't help them out in the right way, or if you, you screwed things up or whatever in Mass Effect 2, they came back as enemies. And it was really just such a, a throwaway thing, you know, in all three cases for that matter. She, she's just... Uh, Banshee, which has no no unique stats, no unique abilities, just a different name. That's it. And even though I never would have, never, literally never would have let Morinth live and never would have taken her on as my squad, I think that they should have done a better job with that. In all three cases, I might add. I think there's actually more than that, but you know, those three cases, the ones I know about, they should have done more than just have a throwaway. Oh, yep, there they are. You screwed up, and now they're evil, and and mindless, and and serve and indoctrinated, and all that fun stuff. Really? That that's what you're doing with that? I, I was just massively disappointed by that. I think that at the very least, if you want to punish the player for for failing, such as with Jack, for example, make it more personal. Like, you know, Mass Effect 2 did. Make you feel that loss. I felt so much more... Uh, I Or I guess... I, no, this actually happened. I, I did fail the suicide mission once, basically. Fail. You know what I mean. Um, but, and Jack died in that mission. And... Actually, she's the first one to die, if, if, if you recall. She's the one, if you don't upgrade the ship properly. Jack dying at, the, in the, at Mass Effect 2. It was pointless death. It was quick. It was brutal. Jack deserved better than that. I liked Jack. I liked all the crew in, in Mass Effect 2. And that mo emotionally affected me more than seeing some random... Uh, I can't even think of the unit name that has a slightly different name. That is Jack, who you kill. That was that felt so throwaway. It's like naming one of the Goombas in Super Mario Brothers Toad, 
and and having no other impact or effect on the storyline whatsoever. Just toad, boop, and you move on. I'm sorry for talking a bit at length here, but it was another way that Mass Effect 3 failed, in my opinion. So let, let, let's, let's move on here. Uh, Gears of War review. I will not be doing a Gears of War review. Partially because, uh, I don't remember which, but several, some of the Gears of Wars, I think it's three, or is it two and three? Anyways, I've only ever played one on the PC. I don't own an Xbox, and so I lack the ability to play them, and I do try to adhere to a d degree of intimate knowledge of, of, of understanding and having analyzed a game in order to give, give the reviews I do, because there's a certain level of quality I want to hold myself to, and if I, and I wouldn't mind doing a Gears of War review, but I would have to really play through the games and really go in depth with them in order to actually give them the, what they deserve, which would be why I would be not be doing that. Have you ever watched uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender? Uh, yes, I have. I'm assuming you're talking about the cart, the show, not the movie. I was warned away from the movie a lot. I didn't like the show, but it was nothing against it. it it's the same thing it always is. It just didn't catch me, and time is always an issue, and I don't have infinite time to go with everything, no matter how mild the interest is. There was some interest there, I'll admit it, but it was mild, and so I just kind of walked away. <sighs> Next question. Uh, twin da -da 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 -da. I'm going to go ahead and answer that one last, because that one's kind of complicated. So, can you still play Mass Effect 1 and 2? This is a little summarized. Can you still play Mass Effect 1 and 2, or did Mass Effect 3 ruin your replays of those for you? No, it did not. Part of the reason is because I'm pretty good at compartmentalizing my brain, and so... For example, I can play Mass Effect 1 and 2 and then basically supplant 3 with what I thought it should be, especially the ending, and keep the good bits. And th there you go, I've just rewritten Mass Effect 3 mentally, and I'll just remember that whenever I want to think of 3. I sincerely doubt I'll be replaying 3, ever. But, not counting multiplayer, multiplayer's a different aspect. But, the point is, I, I can still go back and enjoy Mass Effect 1 and 2 just fine. No problems with that. It'd be like, I, actually I can't think of a good example, but, you know... The game has not ruined it for me. There, there's the summary. Now, next question. <laughs> this is somewhat related. Would you care to share your supplanted ME3 ending, or at least a few details? One of the reasons I kind of skipped over this last time is because I have already shared its ending. In fact, my very first Mass Effect 3 video, which started this whole, you know, people actually watching my videos thing, is is may, about half of what I was talking about it would be my intended ending. But I'm going to go and give you a, a few bullet points, because it's been a while and not everyone's watched those videos. First of all, uh, I, there's a lot of finer details I would change. Let me just get that out of the way. So anything you're going to point out as a plot hole or anything like that is something I have considered. I'm just not talking about it because this is a quick quick run-through, not all the details. Because I would r rewind and basically change a lot of the game, including the intro, and everything from Ranoct onto the ending I would change. But let's just stick with the finale, the ending, and the epilogue. The finale would be... Let's let's start with the charge to the beam. I let's it, it get rid of the beam. The beam isn't really relevant to this because of other reasons I'll get to in a minute. But you charge, you're charging the battlefield, and then the harbinger comes down and starts speaking his lines. And what you have, what what follows, is one of the most epic boss fights in known history, where you have function commands at, or, or I'm sorry, reaction commands like the Assassin's Creed style, in order to order, for example, the Geth troops over there that you happen to have or not have, depending on the circumstances, to, to, to fire on its eastern flank, which makes the Harbinger turn that way, so you can go over here, and you, this whole time you're setting up these artillery pieces all in place, and then you have to order those guys over there, and then you have to go over here, and oh, shoot, okay, here comes a, a, a destroyer or something like that, which you have to fight, and there would just be... I, I've thought this out in great detail, but suffice it to say, there would be this epic, awesome boss fight which would end with the Harbinger falling and being destroyed, and then the... Uh, uh, the Crucible, I'm act this is actually kind of before this, but the Crucible turned out to be a trap. That You found this out before Harbinger showed up. And so the fleet and the combined fleet does end up defeating the Reapers based on how much you've recruited and what you've done. And blah, blah. All of this is variable based on your choices in the game, which is one of the major points of, the, of what I was complaining about back in those videos. But in, in the ideal setup, you know, you have whether you're a Renegade or Paragon, you have enough sh ships, enough combined forces, enough people working together to successfully stop the Reapers at great cost, but you still do it. 
defeat the Reapers and Harbingers. Harbinger just dis is destroyed, and part of his destruction disrupts the Harbin the, the Reapers' thought process, the the brainwave thing they do, which is mentioned several times in the Mass Effect series, and most especially by the Rachni. And that disrupts any remaining Reaper forces basically across the galaxy, to the point where they're not just you know, p uh, droid droidica walk up, fall over and they're gone, but they are much easier to defeat, and so the what what is left is basically a mopping up action, and then there would be this you know, there would be scenes where Shepard is just greeting all her crew, all the ones who survived, all the ones she, she's still uh, or he shows is still interacting with. There would be all these moments of just oh we did it yes, and we'd talk with Anderson and you'd talk with Hackett, and there would be yes good job the the galaxy combined manages this is the first time the galaxy has been free in, in an unknown period of time in a hundred million years for the first time you know we are free, we are alive, and we will celebrate our life, and then there would be this, as Shepard, and there would be a shot, and this would be kind of a, a cut shot, because the idea here is that it looks like Shepard's about to go to this massive celebration party, but in actual fact, the party has already happened. If, if you can follow with me here, let me get the camera up so I can see what I'm doing, okay. The camera, actually, the camera would start, like, up here, this is a bad angle, oh, there we go, and you remember that memorial that was on the Normandy? Well, it would start look, looking at what is essentially that. It would use the same model, uh, modified a bit, as I'll talk about in a minute. And it would start with Shepard just kind of running their hand down the names, and then the camera would zoom out and zoom out and zoom out, and you'd see Shepard standing there on Earth. In, 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 obviously, some time has passed, and you see this memorial, and this memorial is like 200 feet tall and 500 feet wide, and it contains a list of names that is almost Im immeasurable, and it's, the n and it's the names of every single soul who died in the war, and it's this gargantuan memorial. And of course, if Shepard died, uh, someone else would be running their, their hands over this, either your romance option or Garrus, I think, would be a good default, otherwise, maybe Joker. And, and anyway, so Shepard's name would be there as well in that case, but the point being, you know, you'd have this memorial, and you'd be zooming out on that, and then there would be a, a nice little video section for every little one of them, you know, this is what happened with Tali based on what happened, this is what happened with Rex, this is what happened with this, you know. And then you'd go into the epilogue, and the epilogue could do what the Dragon Age thing, or more appropriately, the Babylon 5 thing, which starts, which talks about the future in the long-term sense of the word. You know, here's what happens over the next several decades, and what happens to, as a result of all the choices you made, and all the decisions you made, and all the, the differences you made to the galaxy, here is the net result after the Reapers are defeated. And all this is extremely summarized, because something like that by default has to be immensely complicated. But that is how I would do the Mass Effect 3 ending. Alright, so, next question. Ah, uh, what do you think of the character of Midna from Twilight Princess? Do you think she is more of a romance interest to Link as opposed to Zelda in the other games? And do you think we should see her again in future Lo Legend of Zelda titles? I don't think she was a romance option. I think she was more than that. Uh, there's a term for that, Nakama, I believe. It's a Japanese term. I, I tend to uh, use the term comrades myself. But it means more than friend. It means someone you have truly bonded with. Doesn't have to be romantic. Doesn't have to be uh, intimate or anything. It's just you're right there. And I always felt Midna was an excellent character, as I've I've used her as many times as an example of proper character development, because you know she starts off as a character who's just irritating, and somewhere along the line, without any noticeable change, you suddenly find yourself caring about her. And the same goes for Link as well. And Link and her, it's amazing how much they manage to show the relationship between Link and Mina with no voice acting whatsoever, and with one of the characters never saying a single line in the entire game. But they still pulled it off. And I really liked Mina. Now to your other question, uh, I don't... I I don't think Mina will be in a future Legend of Zelda title, primarily because she wasn't already. They were talking about it a lot, and there was a lot of talk about how much she was demanded to come back and how they were thinking about it, and then Skyward Sword came out, and she's not in it. We'll see. I still hold out a little bit of hope. She was a very popular character, and it's not like they haven't done real sequels before, uh, many times, actually. So, it is probable, and that would be cool if they pulled it off properly. Now, this is kind of a lengthy question. If you had to recommend some good story-based RPGs uh, on the PC, which would they be? And then he lists a list of games he excludes from this list. I'm just going to run this by this for you guys. 
Mass Effect series, Witcher series, Dragon Age series, Baldur's Gate series, Icewind Dins Dale series, Sacred series, Alpha Protocol, the FF7 and 8, KOTOR 1 and 2, the Elder Scrolls series, the Fault Art series, Risen 1 and 2, Gothic series, Two Worlds 1 and 2, Divinity series, Planescape Torment, and the Vampire series. I actually sat down with a friend and was like, what else is there? <laughs> and we only came up with two things. Two games that weren't on that list that were PC RPGs that were story-based and were good. One of these is debatable, and I'll freely admit that. That would be the Diablos. Diablo 2 especially, and all, well, actually Diablo 2 and 3 both uh, especially are fairly very story-based and fairly story-based if you're paying attention. And good RPGs and, and on the PC. And Guild Wars. Now, Guild Wars is a lot cheaper than it used to be, uh, and you might be immediately going, well, that's an MMO. Guild Wars really doesn't qualify as an MMO. In my personal opinion, Guild Wars is best played with two people, three at the most, but Guild Wars is fully soloable, and that's really all I have to add to that. You know, it is a fully soloable PC RPG that is extremely story-based uh, and has a great story, so that would be my recommendation there. Now, the next question the same individual asked... Same basic question, except for the SNES, Nintendo DS, and GBA, not counting games I've already reviewed. This was much easier, because I haven't reviewed a lot of the the, the non-PC games. They didn't give me this giant list of Doom to discount, so I'm just going to go through my giant list of Doom, and some reasons for that. Now, there's the Breath of Fire series, which I don't recommend for anybody who doesn't like uh, difficult games. Breath of Fire 2, I, I still list as, like, the second hardest RPG I've ever played. Um... Final Fantasy 4, Final Fantasy 5, um, I know I said I wouldn't, but Final Fantasy 6, I have to mention it because, because that is, is still such an amazing, incredible game. Uh, the Lufia series, there are two of those on the SNES, one and two. There's one in the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, actually, and that would be, uh, Legends, I believe. And then there's a re there's a reboot. It's not actually a remake. It, they rebooted the canon, and, and it's a reimagining. There we go, that's what I'm going for, on the DS. The Golden Sun series, that's primarily uh, Game Boys again. Final Fantasy Four Heroes of Light, that's on the DS. Mega Man Zero 1 through 4. This one's a little debatable because it's a side-scroller action game, but there are s some d decent RPG elements and it is very story-based and the story's good, I think. So I'm going to go ahead and add that to the list. Uh, also, there's a compilation of 1 through 4 available on the DS, if I'm not mistaken. Radiant Historia, amazing game. Didn't receive nearly as much attention as it deserved. Fantastic game, very much recommend it. Nostalgia, another game not quite as good as uh, Radiant Historia, but still very good and still deserves a, a, a definite nod to how good it is. That's DS as well. Suikoden Tirkris, which I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. In fact, I, I think I am pronouncing that wrong. But that's on the DS. It's the, the latest Suikoden game, not counting the really, really bad one, which we're not going to talk about. Earthbound, yes, I know, I mentioned that in a review, but it's uh, worth mentioning again. That game is fantastic. Uh, Chrono Trigger, yes, I know, <laughs> I mentioned it, but it's worth noting. The Secret of Mana game. The Secret of Mana takes a little bit to get into, and also, you have to take it with a bit of grain of salt due to the backstory, and I'm not going to go into that, but it is still an, one of my favorites. Saiken Densetsu 3, if you can get a hold of it, which is Secret of Mana 2. Dragon Quest 4, 5, 6, and 9 are all out on the DS, and I recommend all of them highly, very highly. If you are capable of dealing with puns, a light-hearted-ish game which ta tackles very serious and tragic issues and doesn't pull its punches when it goes to its plot points and is very plot-focused, I, I, then I really recommend those games. What else we got here? Ogre Battle and Tactics Ogre. Both of those were on the SNES. Tactics Ogre actually came out on a lot of systems, but Ogre Battle was, was the really good one on the SNES. One of my favorites of that. That's a, Most of those are tactical RPGs, you know, strategy, but they're still story heavily story-based. Kingdom Hearts 358 in over two days, which I, I had to p mention that one specifically because that's the only one that's... Well, I guess Recoded is there too, but I can't speak to that one yet. But that's the one that's on the DS of the list you mentioned. I would strongly recommend not playing that unless you've played, at the very least, Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 first. That's just my opinion. Those, those are both on the PS2. And I think I'm going to stop there. My friend and I stopped there and we're like, okay, let, let's go ahead and call that a good list. So, there's my recommendations. Hopefully uh, at least some of those sound appealing to you or anybody who's watching this. Ah, did I play Chrono Cross? If so, thoughts on the game? I'm going to go ahead and be completely honest here, okay? 
I hated Chrono Cross. I couldn't stand it. It bugged the heck out of me. The music was bad. The what they did, the the story, if you could call it that, I didn't like. You know, there were several things I just did not enjoy about that game. Now let me add onto this, because <laughs> I know all of you are, are thinking, "Ah, oh, kill him." I, I've been getting flack for that for forever, ever since it came out, actually. I am one of these days, <laughs> hopefully soon, going to go back and replay Chrono Cross now that I'm, you know, older, and tend to in, tend to appreciate and enjoy things more. Because there is one thing I will give Chrono Cross. Even then, I gave it to it. The story behind Chrono Cross was incredibly complicated almost ludicrously so. It's it's it often held up as the example of one of the most complicated video game plots in history. And I liked that. I liked the fact that it was immensely de de in-depth, complicated, took a lot of thought and, and effort to actually figure out what was going on. And I liked that. And for anyone who's asking, yes, I did uh, free Shala. I did do the, the optional ending and do the music mana thing in order to get the secret ending, all that stuff. So just in case anyone's curious... But I do want to go back and give it another shot someday, just to see. But I don't have a lot of hope. And now I'm going to go have to call it, cut this off again. So. <laughs> hey, what can I do for you? No problem, Bobby Ryder. Alright, um, I did just lie bold face to the customer there, but I really don't feel like doing an edit just to go uh, put away something that I can do any time in the night, because there's no time rush on that. I've got stuff here I could work on anyways. Moving on, <laughs> um, where was I? Alright, alright. Okay, this next question, sorry about that, guys. Next question is... If they made a real-life holodeck and it was free, would you use it and how? Yes, I would use it. This is uh, one of the questions I was leaving for the last for the last to go through because this is kind of complicated. I have said before, I think it would be overall a bad thing if a holodeck was made into a real thing. And the reason why is because, in my opinion, most people, statistically speaking, do not know what the word moderation means. They do not know how to take things with a degree of of moderation, you know, with, with all things to their end and all that. And so, it would be very likely that some people would take the holodeck too far, and that type of invention has the ability to essentially ruin a society. That being said, something that is commented on a lot in Star Trek itself, and something that I personally would feel, is that it wouldn't be the same as the real thing. It would be fun for things that cannot be done in real life, but, for example, I uh, am a very uh, physically active person. I, I, I enjoy... Uh, I, I don't get to do this here, obviously, because the facilities don't exist. I don't have the time. But uh, once upon a time, I used to enjoy mountain climbing. I used to enjoy swimming, surfing, you know, uh, rock climbing, all that kind of thing, right? And I wouldn't mind doing that on the holodeck, but I would still prefer to do it in real life because... And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to completely misquote Captain Kirk here. In, in completely out of context, but the same, the same effect applies. I must have jumped over that ravine a hundred times, and every time my heart stopped and I was afraid. Except for this time, because it's not real. And there would be enough people like me who would know and would think in the back of their brain there, this isn't real, and so it would not feel the same. It would not process the same way. And however real it felt, even with the safeties off, it would never actually be real. Part of us would still know that. And that would be one of my big problems with it. So that would be... So the holodeck is... I would basically only use for the kinds of things I cannot do in real life. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. One of the things I love to do with several of my friends is what-if debates. This is such a huge topic that I have no way of summarizing. So I'm only going to use one example of, like, 850. Because we've been debating this for years and years and years, off and on, of every topic you can imagine. So we're going to use one example to get, get across the concept of what I'm talking about. Star Trek Voyager. Star Trek Voyager had so much potential, and had the all the pieces in place to become the best Star Trek to date, in my opinion. It really was so close. And one of the more frustrating things about the show is they kept getting so 
close to something awesome, and then they just drop it. You know, in the later seasons, they would have episodes of, of strong character development and growth and, and, and important themes and good writing, but it would be completely and utterly dropped, and, and it, would, it would actually be behaving as though the next episode should be continuing the theme, like a serial, like Babylon 5 did, or Farscape, or anything like that. But it didn't. It was just dropped, and the next episode had absolutely nothing to do with it, and, and it pretended like it never even existed. And so Voyager would be a show that I would put on the holodeck and say, all right, you know, computer. Hello, computer. That, sorry. I got to use the mouse for that. Hello, computer. And uh, I would get on the holodeck and say, all right, load Star Trek Voyager. And I'd go ahead and pick a role. Doesn't matter who. It really doesn't. I'd probably go with Chakotay if I had a choice in the matter. Or Tuvok or Paris. But anyways, probably Paris, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. I would pick a role. And I would say, all right, computer, modify the series so that this and this and this are different. And then run. And then I would basically run through the series of interactive, interactive episodes, except with those few changes. And so the series would be different. And, and because, as I've mentioned before, a holodeck is essentially a true AI and capable of dynamic adap adaptation the entire show would be changed, and everything that happened would be changed because of those edits I made. And so I would get to see Voyager properly. I would get to see Voyager done well, you know? And there are so many uses for that, even in a good show. Let me use another example here really quick. Deep Space Nine. One of the things I always felt that was a misstep with Deep Space Nine is I felt Gold Dukat should have been a more sympathetic and tragic villain by the end. They turned him into the pure evil, and the reason is because there was a miscommunication between the people involved in writing, acting, and producing the show. He was originally intended to be the pure evil, the black of, this, of an otherwise very gray show, and but that, that wasn't communicated properly, and so he ended up becoming much more of a great character. Now, I thought they should have kept going with that. So an edit I would make would be just to use a direct... I could use a specific example here, because this is easy. Make it so that Dukat is not evil or at least not that kind of evil, make it so that he genuinely believes in the Paw Wraiths and genuinely is working with them, and Kai Wynn is the one who's been possessed by a Paw Wraith this whole time, and she is the one who is the pure dark of the setting, and she is the one who ends up being the final boss, basically, the final villain of the series. I think that would be an excellent change and would really improve a lot of the latter part of the series and really add to the flavor of it. And it, would be, it wouldn't change too many things, but... You have to admit, any, anybody who knows DS9, if, if I told you Kai Wynn was the, the most evil character in that show, very few people would argue with me that I know of who, who've seen the show. And very few people would at the very least say, would defend her. You know, They might say someone, oh no, this person is more evil. Yeah, okay, that's great, but most people would still agree she's an evil, horrible person. First episode, they showed that. Very first episode, she showed up. So wouldn't it not even be surprising to learn that she was the one who the Paris had possessed all those years ago, and she'd been working towards this this whole time? That's the kind of thing I'd use the holodeck for. It would also be an artificial way of doing the romanticized Tier 3 insertion thing. For example, load Fallout 3, computer, zoom, and I wouldn't have to worry about, you know, the, the dirt or the smell or the bathroom or anything like that, or, or getting eaten in my sleep by a, a crab. It... it, it <laughs> It's it's almost a tier four technically. It's like halfway between tier three and tier four is is the holodeck in that kind of situation because you just enjoy all the benefits with none of the detriments. So that's the kind of thing I would use the holodeck for for enjoying games directly, and for enjoying shows directly with a few edits. And sometimes I wouldn't edit. You know, sometimes I'd just be like, "Computer, load Babylon Five, the end. Load Farscape." the end. Get rid of the eye scene in Farscape. Then we're good. That one scene, just get rid of that one scene, and we're good with Farscape. You know, that's all I'd have to do. I apologize for rambling a little bit on, but that would be what I would do with the holodeck. Now, I have a bit of an in-depth uh, geeko question here. Not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just warning everyone. There is a recurring theme in Star Wars that no matter what era it is, the Jedi, though they ultimately try to do good and better the galaxy, ultimately fall to the dark side and cause a new Dark Age and the return of the Sith. Do you think Star Wars will finally end and will finally achieve peace throughout the galaxy when there are no more Jedi and no more Sith to battle one another? Or perhaps Kreia was right and the death of the Force is the correct path to take, and what are your thoughts on this? This is a very complicated issue. 
Now, let's be honest with ourselves. The Force, as it has been described, um... E let's ignore midi-chlorians for a second. We just have to say that. Even George Lucas started ignoring midi-chlorians. I, I just feel like pointing that out. Even Lucas was like, okay, yeah, that, that was a bad idea. He also acknowledged that Jar Jar Binks is a bad idea, so I'll give the man some credit. But let's move on. Midi-chlorians are not a part of this discussion, is what I'm trying to get across here. The Force, as it has been described, is essentially the life energy of everything. Right? And some people are more attuned with it than others, and some in some different ways than others, and some people can use it directly. The death of the Force would not mean the end of the Jedi and the Sith. The death of the Force would mean the slow decay and death of the entire galaxy. And this is nowhere more emphasized in the fact that my nose really itches right now. I need to go get a Kleenex really quick. This is nowhere more emphasized than in KOTOR 2, where... Ah... Uh, the... how do I put this? Uh, the galaxy as a whole was de de derailing, basically. Everything was going wrong everywhere in a way no one could define. No one could understand exactly what was going wrong. Excuse me. Ah! And no one could really figure it out because so few people had the information necessary to put the pieces together and say, you know, there is a wound in the Force, and it's growing, and it's causing the entire galaxy to go wonky. I think the galaxy would slowly self-destruct, societally and literally, if there was the death of the Force. That's just my personal take on it. That being said, I personally think they will never actually end the cycle, ignoring the fact that the cycle's been going on for at least 20,000 years at this point, as, as, you know, the Infinite Empire actually means it's been going on for longer than that. But it is very likely the cycle will will basically never end, and that's how Star Wars will continue to be the War of the Stars because it it never stops. However, it, if I were in tasked with okay, end Star Wars, the way I would do it would be to bring balance to the Force in the way that makes more sense to me, rather than the way Lucas was trying to emphasize it, which is not to wipe out the dark side and have the light side become the balance of the Force but rather to find the balance between the two sides. Because if you think about it, what has been happening over the last 22 plus thousand years is if we've got the dark side over here and the light side over here, it'll be like this, and then everything will, f you know, the Jedi or the Sith or the people will force to correct it and we'll get this. And then they'll try and correct it, and so forth and so on. So there's never actually been... This, right here, in, in known recorded history, this has never happened. It's always been this or this. And I think working towards this point would be the goal here. Enough Dark Jedi, not Sith, emphasis, not Sith, but Dark Jedi who have brains and who understand what's going on and, and try work together. Enough Light Jedi who aren't idiots and who are not, you know, the Jedi Order and the Kood and enough gray Jedi in the middle, and getting this mix balanced out and cooperating in such a way that this happens. That is how I... Now, that would be extremely difficult to pull off properly, and it would be quite a challenge, but that is how I would do it personally, and that is how I... the only way I think it really could end personally. But then that is also my opinion, and of course, based on my, uh... concept of 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 how Star Wars works, which is admittedly a little bit different than canon has now stated. Used to be canon, and then Lucas stepped in and said, No, 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 it works this way. Anyways. Ah, last question of the night here, I think. Yes, okay. Uh, hey, Arshan Gaia. Hey, what's up? You said in your... What you said in your last Q&A about your inner storyline, including the Bastion and Mass Effect, really piqued my interest. Now, I've heard the motivations of many people behind the character within a game universe, but none are as unique as yours. I'd really like to hear more about this universe. It sounds like it is rich with lore and a lot of effort has gone into structuring what is probably a very dynamic setting. I'd also love to hear about how you go about to create this universe and its characters, as it sounds like an enormous undertaking. It is, without question, an enormous undertaking. The... The Imperial storyline that covers the Bastion and the Elements and the Hands and the Empire is a massive storyline. If I were to put it into book format, I already would have enough material right now, even if I summarized specific settings and their interactions, to cover... God, I don't even know. Dozens of books. I've been writing this story in my head for decades, literally. 
So, and, and when I say writing, I mean just adding on and adding on and adding on. I have always had the mindset to be able to keep track of things like that. That's one of the reasons uh, I enjoy GMing, is because I have no problem keeping track like that and making knowing where everything is and all that sort of thing. And it's also worth noting that one of the things I do, I don't remember if I mentioned this last time, but this doesn't just affect games and settings and all that. Every story I have ever written, every book I have ever written, every setting I have ever designed is also connected within this overarching storyline. Now, it's not always a big connection. It doesn't always have to be, this happened because of this, but there is always that connection there, and it's always something that makes sense. That's, whoops, excuse me. That is the important part to me, that it makes sense, and that's, that's the thing that is probably the most difficult thing to do. I recently have been designing a campaign that I've been, that I don't actually have a name for. I need to think of a name for the setting. Dirithaean or something like that. But anyways, the this setting is something I've been designing recently. And I because it's uh, got a lot of custom rules, I've been doing a lot of work of laying down, you know, this this is how this spell works, this is how magic works, this is how mono regen works, this is how stat progression works, this is, you know, blah 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 blah. All the all the specific details of that. But that all that stuff I only started working on this week. The last three months, I have been setting up the so the story, the setting, the, s the, the tale, the world that this is occurring within, and all the rules therein. And as I was basically finalizing it and was really happy with where it sat, I, I reached the point that I always do. I sit back and say, okay, how does it fit in? And I thought about that for quite a while, and I, I actually have the most brilliant way for it to fit into my... And this is actually a suggestion from a friend of mine. Or at least, you know, we bounced off each other ideas and, and it turned out like this. The way it works is because the Empire likes people to be able to solve their own problems, Does not the Empire doesn't want to be too heavy-handed. You know, if you have a problem that you can't solve, we will step in to help you. But otherwise, we're just going to try and assist you to fix your own problems, assist you with your own growth and your own, fr in your own uh, society so that you still have the freedom and the choice to exist. Because this is how I think, again, because this whole thing is based on me. And so, in this setting, very uh, there are some very serious problems going on, but none of them are of a scale that the Empire would have to interact with personally. They would not. They would never. Ha they would not have to send even the military, let alone the hands or the elements or the you know the top of the tier, which is the Bastion. So they have several Imperial diplomats that happen to be present in various locations. Now I can't tell you what where they are, and the reason is because several of the friends who are going to be playing this campaign watch these videos, and I don't want spoilers in here. But several of the individuals that they will encounter, almost assuredly, are going to be Imperial diplomats who are in incognito, basically. They're there to get a feel for the area, to uh, interact with its culture, get, interact with its people, figure out how their society works, figure out how their culture works, figure out how their technology works, figure out how their magic works, figure out how people think on an individual level. Are they, are they divided along clan lines? Are they divided along elemental lines? Are they divided along age lines? Are they divided along species lines? Are they divided along gender lines? Are they divided at all? You know, all these things are important things that need to be uh, ascertained about a new world that, that has been encountered. And these people are here to, to discover and to provide help if needed based on the circumstances. Because so far, their analysis of the threat of the situation is such that, they'll be able to, that the world itself will be able to deal with it. Now, <laughs> it's worth noting that Everything, like I said, everything I've ever done is tied into this overarching story, and I, I could go into so much detail about it for, for so long. And I like it all to make sense. That's always the key. It all has to make sense. It all has to fit in some way, you know. For example, in another setting I also wrote, uh, the Elementi setting, why is it that a creature of this kind of power is not something that the Empire is dealing with? The answer was actually quite simple. This creature was actually running from an Imperial agent at the time, actually a hand, that would be, uh, I can't remember who actually off the top of my head, but one of the hands was uh, chasing after this creature. This creature ended up becoming locked within what was essentially a segregate plane, which is divided from the rest of reality except for beings of tremendous power, such as this one. But because this plane is an expressive plane, which means that anything within functions the way it should rather than the way it would otherwise. You know, it doesn't obey the laws of physics per se. It obeys the laws of what should happen. And a creature of that power and relative danger should automatically be contained. And so 
so one one day in the middle of the, the the existence of these creatures, a moon just kind of popped into existence over in the skies above, and the planet adjust in order to accommodate the gra gravimetric shifts and the the different poles and tides that the moon would have upon the planet's existence. And now this creature is basically within this moon, uh, locked within it, basically unable to do anything except for the the absolute most meager of, of abilities within it, and so. Thus, I have an extremely powerful enemy that can that is directly tied to the overall canon, and indeed is being kept there partially as a result of the actions of the hand who was revolting, re resolved, was dealing with the situation. And that creature is limited such that it's still a threat, because even limited so, it is still more powerful than anything else walking around on this planet. But it is so limited that no, it cannot simply overwhelm anything else on the rest of this planet. And if things ever got out of hand, the the uh, the Empire would be able to directly intervene, remove the veil, and simply remove the problem, as indeed they would have done normally, except for the fact that the entire society of the world adjusted to the existence of this thing. If you follow me here, I, I, I know I'm getting a little bit rambling, and I do apologize. This is why I wanted to do this question last. Because I could go on and on and on and on for so long about the Imperial storyline and how it connects with everything. You know, every MMO I've ever played, every video game I've ever played, a lot of the settings I've ever seen, and everything I personally have ever written or designed is tied in with this overall story. And uh, if anyone else likes, you know, likes doing that, I recommend it. It does take a lot of upkeep if you want to actually keep up with it. But most hobbies, most things that we enjoy in life do, and so it doesn't really bother me. Now... Unless anyone's asked any questions in the last two minutes, which is extremely likely, actually. Uh, I'm done for the night. I'm caught up in my Q&A again for the week. Oh my goodness, my throat hurts. I guess I'll, it's actually a lot later than I thought it was, too. So I may or may not be doing another little video tonight. We'll see what happens. But either way, I will talk to you guys later.